morning, everybody. Good morning. I always wish that when I'm the first person to speak in a room of people who are obviously engaged in already engaging conversation, that there was sort of a musical intro. It wouldn't have to be my voice that interrupted them. I apologize. Um, but I am here to welcome you. My name is Ping Ann Addo, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology here at UMass Boston, and I'm also the director for the Center for Innovative Teaching, CIT. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th Annual University Conference on Teaching, Learning, and Technology. This event evolved out of another teaching conference that used to be hosted by CIT, and it continues to be a UMass Boston-focused event. This is one of my favorite events of the year because it deals with the thing that all faculty have in common, given that we have different service assignments, different ways and the context in which we do our research. It deals with teaching, instructing, learning from, with, from and with our students. We are a teaching university, among other things, after all. On my way in through the weather this morning, <laughs> um, I got onto the elevator, something I rarely do during the semester because you know what it's like at the elevators, right? <laughs> Two elevators per large building. Everybody needs to get everywhere. I got in the elevator because there was no one else waiting and someone said, going up? I said yes, I held the door. And I greeted someone I'd never met before. Um, and this was a colleague who's been here a number of years Jim Chaffrey, lecturer in accounting and finance. Hi, Jim. <laughs> so we met for the first time. We both work in this building. He's on the fifth floor, I'm on the fourth floor, and here we meet on the first floor of McCormack on the way to the third floor, okay? And he said two things that made me like him instantly. He comes to this conference every year that he's been teaching here at UMass Boston, and he said, and I quote, it's a great event. It is so validating to feel appreciated for the work I do on the UCTLT conference committee at 8.15 on a rainy morning, did I mention that? At the end of a long semester. It warmed my heart, and it warmed, and it, it warmed my heart that despite the weather, we're here to talk about this thing that we're all good at and trying to get better at and trying to collaborate with each other to do as well as we possibly can for the students whom I know matter in all of our lives. And so, I just want to say I'm so proud to be a member of this community of teachers to which we all belong. Let me tell you a little bit, not a little bit, I'll just mention to whom we owe the, the existence of this event. I need to thank iClicker for sponsoring the event. Um, this is going to sound odd, I'm thanking CIT for sponsoring the breakfast, but you know, we sponsored the breakfast and we're really happy to be able to uh, contribute a little something towards a day like this. I'm supposed to remind you that Participants, that means everybody in the room who attends a session um, should try to complete the survey. Um, uh, there's a URL. Am I supposed to be clicking through the slides, Apurva? Okay, good. I'm glad because clearly I'm not ready for that. Um, there is a URL on your table and also on any of your registration materials. And there is a survey to which you can go to put your thoughts on any of the sessions as well as the entire conference. So please do that. And we're proud to say that we are going green. So the survey is not a paper survey this year. Um, you can download the guidebook app, which is available for both Apple and Android. Uh, we printed only a limited number of conference booklets. Again, we are going green. Um, so uh, we hope you won't feel inconvenienced that there aren't, there isn't one booklet, program booklet for each of you, but please get it on your phone or your tablet or your laptop. Demo tables will be open after the speed talks this morning and during lunch. Um, and here you'll be able to meet with EdTech uh, staff and the librarians who are here to help us enhance our teaching. Uh, you can learn about iClickers, Echo 360, Classroom Capture, VoiceThread, and something a little more unusual, I think, 3D printers. I think most of us have not even maybe used a 3D printer in the context of class. Um, and so we can learn about how we can apply some of this to the work we're doing, as well as the Healy Library's new research and discovery tool called Primo. I'd like to introduce the team uh, that put this conference together for you, both to thank them for their hard work, it's been a pleasure working with them another year, but also to point out to you who you might 
latch on to if you need some help at the conference today with logistics and so on. So when I call your name, team members, could you please stand and maybe make a little gesture and wave? Apoorva Mehta, our fearless leader. Uh, <laughs> Um, myself, Ping An. Oh, sorry, I didn't need you to, to clap for me. Professor Judith Goldman of the Office of Faculty Development and the English Department. Professor Brian White of Biology. And also the Provost Fellow for Teaching, Learning and Technology. Wendy Shapiro, who unfortunately can't be with us today. She's the Associate Dean of Learning, Design and Technology at CAPS. Oliver Chen, I saw Oliver earlier. Where is he? Oh, there you are, Oliver. <laughs> Professor Kathleen Zara of the math department. Professor. All right. Oh, yes, that's right. He's out of town. Professor Philip Chuchkov from engineering. Camille Martinez, also from the Office of Faculty Development. Ayana McCoy. There we go. Okay. Jason Campos from CAPS, okay, and Jean Schwalb from Learning and IT. There you are, okay. All right. I think next year we'll make funny hats so that you can see us all more easily. If you need anything from one of us, just let us know. We're happy to help you. One of us will be in each classroom where we're gonna have the breakout sessions. So if you see one of us in your classroom, we're the person to ask about turning on the mic and so on before you give your presentation. In addition, Zach Ronald and another IT member, Zach's back there waving at you. Um, another IT staff member whose name I've forgotten um, will be floating to help you with um, any tech needs you have in the rooms. And so with that, I wanna wish you a wonderful conference. Don't forget to fill out the survey because if you let us know how to, fill out how to improve this conference, you'll be contributing to an important legacy here at UMass Boston. Um, this is our university after all. We teach here. It's our event, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Okay. I would like now to introduce our um, Chief Information Officer, Robert Weir, who is going to introduce our speed talk. I get uh, regularly accused of, of uh, booming into microphones, so if I start to blow you out of the room, let me know. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, um, one of the things that I take away from UMass Boston and one of the things that I sell about UMass Boston is our capabilities in the, air, in the area of technology-assisted instruction, whether it's online or, or on ground. Um, and uh, compared to the, to the other UMass campuses, nobody does it better than us. Uh, and I declare that every chance I get. Uh, you know, the importance of, of instruction in, in this university, given our mission uh, and our commitments, is obvious. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense that this is not only um, our most important service, and we deliver it in partnership with the library and CAPS, um, not only our most important service, but also um, one of our best. And so the credit to Aperva and the team and all of you for for building a foundation that uh, is the envy of other campuses. Um, I'd like to, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you know, our new um, incoming leader, Barry Mills, I had a, uh, a meeting with him in March, and literally the first thing out of his mouth was, tell me about teaching with technology, uh, because he understands uh, from his prior institution the value of, of delivering using electronic capabilities. Uh, and so that was encouraging to me. There's also lots of discussions going on about, about delivery at scale and, uh, and how we can all do a, a better job of, of serving our students wherever they might be. Uh, and so in that sense, um, in that sense we're, we're uh, well positioned to continue to invest in this area. But, but there is no more important service uh, and there is no more important partnership, whether the partnership is with CAPS and the library or the partnership with is, is with each of you uh, as a Perva and Gene and the team uh, do everything they can to make you successful. Um, you know, we are making significant investments despite the current environment. So for instance, this year we will be doing all the preventative maintenance we do every summer uh, on all the AV in the classroom because there's nothing worse than having a cl classroom AV that fails a 
fails a faculty member, and no matter how fast we respond, it's not fast enough by definition. Uh, so we're doing a lot of investment this summer in continuing to in, in improve some classrooms in the sense of taking them from analog to digital, and then just do the standard preventative maintenance that allows us to have such a reliable service in the classrooms, uh, thanks to John Jesso and his team. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the IT staff as well as the committee uh, for forming this. Um, uh, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, there is no important topic, more important topic, and this conference is an opportunity for everybody uh, to get on the same page, to understand the path forward, and, uh, and respond accordingly. So thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you have a good conference. <laughs> Judith. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to um, give you the names and titles of the four speed talks we're about to um, listen to. We won't be introducing people individually. We started this speed, the speed talk um, sessions last year, and they were very successful. We're um, hoping for the same this year. The first presentation is titled Evolution from Teaching to Facilitating, Developing a Three-Dimensional Perspective for Meaningful Teaching and Learning. It will be presented by um, Teja Sweeney Dalvey. Uh, Teja Sweeney Dalvey is an assistant professor of science education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and COSMIC, which stands for the Center of Science and Mathematics in Context. Tej received her doctorate in theoretical physics from Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany in 2009. In fall 2016, she joined UMass Boston. Within her first year, she received two NSF grants and a grant from a private foundation for a total of about $2 million to advance research in the field of science, engineering education, and learning sciences. The second presentation is titled Teaching Engineering to Next Generation Engineers. Um, it it's, will be presented by Kimberly Hamad Schifarelli. Kimberly is an associate professor in the Department of Engineering. She obtained her PhD in chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley in 2000. Since 2015, she's been a founding member of the Mechanical Engineering Program at UMass Boston and holds a visiting science position at MIT. She has received an ONR Young Investigator Award, was named a fellow of the Foresight Institute, and serves on the ACS Physical Chemistry Executive Committee. Our third presentation is titled, Putting the Action into Active Learning. The presenter is Robin Hannigan. Robin Hannigan is the founding dean of the School of Environment at UMass Boston. Throughout her career, she has focused her energy on innovation, whether in the lab or in administration. In the school, she and her colleagues built upon the, the pioneering spirit of the, um, that established the environment, environmental science program in 1982. The school is the only such unit in the United States that integrates all disciplines to solve real environmental problems facing our coasts and communities. To be the leaders, pedagogy cannot be static. Learning must happen in real time through action. Our, our fourth presentation is titled, Designing Courses That Use Technology to Enhance Collaborative Learning. The presenter is Marilyn Morgan. Marilyn Morgan is the current director of the Archives Program and a lecturer in history. She investigates and encourages students to explore social trends, cultural stereotypes, and discrimination of various sorts through American history. Before joining the faculty at UMass Boston in 2014, she worked as an archivist at Harvard's Schlesinger Library. Currently, she's working on a book about the history of swimsuits as cultural artifacts and the advertising of swimwear, convenience foods, and beauty products in the 20th century. So um, we'll be listening to these now. And um, Teja Sweeney, are you here to come up and uh, get us started? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm pretty much new around here. So just a couple years back with PhD and postdoctoral experience from the here during I thought nothing is gonna go wrong if I have to teach an undergraduate physics class from freshman year. But trust me, I entered the class and ten minutes down I knew I was heading for a complete teaching disaster. Yes, it was so true. It was a complete teaching disaster. 
I didn't give up. And I sort of tried to well equip myself with a lot of uh, innovative technology. Clicker is the sticking in back then, and I tried to topple it along with PowerPoint presentations. Results, disaster strikes again. I'm fighter. I didn't give up still. And then I thought, oh, I was reading about the peer learning through discussions. It's all, oh, let us sit down. And I thought, okay, I want to sort of, it's on. Sorry? And I want to sort of uh, bring in all the collaborative learning platforms. And now I go into the classroom, well equipped with three different tools. Results, history just repeats. History repeated again for me. At this point, it was getting a little beyond frustration. Because you know, the continuous yawns and the rolling of the eyes and the worst part was stopping that was taking place in my classes. And I kept on asking myself, why are the students so disengaged, so disconnected? What's wrong with them? But that was the point. Nothing was wrong with the students. It was me. It was my perspective and my approach that I had to go into the class to teach and to give and to share knowledge. <coughs> and that had to be changed. Because for meaningful learning, it's all about the knowledge building process. And I have to go in there to provide the scaffolds and let's get the supports in order to create this meaningful teaching learning platforms. But oh, that's not a one step process. How do I do that? It's essential to understand how does learning take place. And that sort of dictated my evolution from being a mere content person, a physicist, towards understanding the pedagogy. And from being an instructor or a teacher, to rather towards facilitating. Facilitating uh, through meaningful and engaging experiences, that would help the students to coherently build scientific knowledge. And that's a... And that sort of uh, dictated uh, my evolution even into research and work towards developing a three-dimensional framework for pre meaningful, creating meaningful learning and teaching platforms with three essential dimensions which sort of feed into and from each other, creating authentic learning context. Now definitely content in a formal classroom uh, setting definitely tends to get a little abstract. And in order to deal with that, trying to help students relate to and identify with experiences and hence creating authentic learning uh, platforms for the students. Using technology, seeing from my previous, little previous experience, it wasn't enough to go into the classrooms with just any innovative technology, but trying to use that technology A, meaningfully and appropriately, meaning trying to see the technology that is best suited for the content we want to deliver in the classroom. And secondly, trying to use it innovatively. Example, why just use it as a mere piece of technology? Why not turn it into, let's say, a formative assessment tool, a tool that would inform the facilitator something about the students, their trajectory, what are their ideas, a formative assessment tool. And taking both these factors towards responsive teaching, which I believe is the most crucial aspect of the framework, which means trying to adapt your instructions to the learning needs of the students, learning to respond. And the first thing there is learning to notice. It's about developing an entirely fresh and a new professional vision for teachers. Now, this isn't just a framework, but within the past year, our research team has been trying to take this framework and apply it to different contexts. One is a graduate level education course that I teach here as, at CNI. A, the, a graduate level computational physics workshop which I have been co-facilitating every year at ICTP 3S in summer. An undergraduate mechanical engineering class in collaboration with professors at Tufts University. And my most favorite, and I believe the most challenging um, uh, uh, context is the elementary classrooms. And we are also working with a few Boston public school classrooms. And to conclude, I would want to specifically talk about the implementation of this framework um, within my methods courses. So these are the science and engineering methods courses, and it's a graduate level course, and it's an essential requirement for the teacher training licensure program here. Now how do we see these, the three aspects that I spoke of, of the framework, being translated into these courses? First, we're trying to introduce community-based engineering projects. Now with community-based, we are trying to help our teachers relate 
the schools to the communities, connect the schools and the communities, and this in turn provides a real life and an authentic context for learning. And by bringing an engineering into the classroom, it's a way to contextualize science and mathematics happening. For our technological resources, we've developed a portable maker space. Now, this is not as fancy as a 3D lab. It's a little portable maker, maker, maker cart, which is pretty much accessible and sort of supports learning by doing. And it is also trying to support the entire STEM, um, uh, the STEM movement, trying to get hands-on activities and STEM-based uh, learning in elementary classrooms. And we also use a lot of classroom videos. And the third important aspect is different assessment tools. We've developed the student video case diagnosis and curriculum critique and revision uh, analysis as sort of assessment tools towards uh, strengthening our pre-service teachers' pedagogical content knowledge, which is an essential aspect of teacher training program. And then we also are, we are using those classroom videos extensively where we do a lot of collaborative analysis. So when our pre-service teachers um, sort of, uh, uh, they do their student teaching, we record them, and then there is a collaborative analysis of what happens in the classroom. The student to student interaction, student teacher interaction, and a student teacher and an expert interaction. So, this is sort of talk, the talk between research and teaching. And we're just into the first year of implementation. I'm pretty new. I'm, I'm a novice in the field. So I don't think I have found my aha teaching moments. But I think I definitely have way fewer yawns in my classroom. I do get a lot of smiles and a couple thank you hugs on my last day. Thank you. Great, hi, um, I'm Kim Hamad Shifferly. I'm from um, the Department of Engineering and I'm gonna talk to you about how uh, we're going to teach to the next generation engineers. So just a little bit about my background. I just started here last fall. I teach the um, Engineering 104 uh, class, which is the introduction to, to engineering, electrical and computer engineering for our majors. And then I also teach um, a mechanics class, strength of materials. Um, in addition to that, so in mechanical engineering. So my background and training is actually in science. So both my degrees are in chemistry, not engineering. Um, but I was at MIT for 10 years and I taught uh, mechanical engineering and then also developed um, a bioengineering course that was part of their newest uh, major, biological engineering. So I'm kind of a pseudo engineer. And so uh, many people here at UMass Boston actually are still trying to get familiar with um, the Department of Engineering because we're so new. And so I thought it would be important to talk to you about what engineering is, okay, and why we want to teach it. So uh, in general, the engineering, uh, what engineers do is that they try to solve real world problems. Okay, so if you look back in history, um, there are engineers for a long time. They're the ones that built the pyramids or the Panama Canal, and nowadays we think about things like the space station. Okay, and in general, uh, what engineers do is that they have to take an abstract idea and put it into reality in a way that solves some sort of problem. Okay, and, and typically engineers try to do things in a cost-effective manner, and then also um, it's imperative that they work in teams, right? So no single person can have built this alone or this. Okay. Now, the thing about engineering is that what we try to ingrain in students from day one is this engineering design process. And this is what really separates us from science, okay? And so I'm just gonna go briefly through this. So pretty much what happens, what engineers do is that they define the problem that they wanna solve. Okay, so let's say you, know, you have a vi village in rural India that has no access to water, they have no electricity, and um, there's no real infrastructure. Okay, so that's a problem. And then what they do is they try to come up with a solution for this problem through this design process. And so they do background research, they figure out, okay, how much do things cost, what is accessible to those people, okay, and then they come up with requirements for this solution that they're gonna come up with. Okay, and engineers, this is the most important about engineering is that they brainstorm um, the possible solutions or come up with concepts and they build prototypes and they test them and then often they will fail and then they go back and iterate, okay? And so finally when they come up with a solution that works, that meets all the requirements, ta-da, they have something um, that is a final product that can solve that solution, sol solve that problem. Okay, and then finally they communicate the results. Now this arc is really critical to every type of engineering that we teach. So whether they become fluid mechanics or they study mechanics or they build robots, okay, or make solar cells, 
this design process has to be ingrained into students. And it's really important to distinguish it from science. Okay, so I was trained as a science, and as a scientist, you're trained to formulate a hypothesis and test it. Okay, so the arc may look different, right? So there are some, it may look the same. So there's some elements that are similar. Okay, you still iterate. You design an experiment and you test it and you keep going until you get to um, the answer to your question. But it's really important to remember that uh, engineers start from a completely different perspective. Okay, they want to make a, they want to solve a problem, okay, in a practical way. Okay, and this is something that is really critical for engineering. So um, this is often easy to mix these up. Most people will, um, because uh, all engineering is based on some sort of scientific discipline. So chemical engineering is based on chemistry, mechanical engineering is based on physics, and so forth. Okay, and the other aspect that's really critical to teaching engineering is that engineering inherently is multidisciplinary. So if you think about building the Panama Canal, there's a lot of things involved. There's materials, there's hydrodynamics, there's operations research, et cetera, okay? And so obviously other things like math and physics are essential to teaching engineering. Okay, so what are the next generation engineers look like? Okay, so if we look back into the past, like the Apollo uh, command module from the 60s, okay, the first image that comes to mind is a team of guys with slide rules and pocket protectors, right? Okay, and uh, engineering has changed dramatically since the 60s, but it's also changed dramatically in the last five or 10 years. Okay, so we in engineering are trying to adapt in order to um, evolve with this, okay, because it's, it's changing rapidly. So what does engineering look like? Like now, okay. So many, so Aperva is here, and he said the makerspace. So one thing is makerspaces are prevalent. Okay, so we have a 3D printer here. We actually use it in our classes. Okay, and makerspaces are you see them now in people's garages. You see them in your library. You see them in your K through 12 schools. You see them in your colleges. Okay, and what this uh, uh, it happens is that you have all of these kids who are suddenly literate in making and prototyping, and that really essential part of the design process. Okay, so this is um, inherent from the, the very early ages. Okay, so I have a nine-year-old. I have tons of 3D printed doohickeys at my house because they have access to these at schools. Okay, so this changes the literacy of students that are coming into college. Okay, this has also been fueled by the availability of a lot of open source software and also hardware. So there are things like Arduinos, this costs $10 now, an open source code that you can steal from the web and um, basically uh, use it to prototype systems. Okay, in addition, um, engineers like to do things like crowdsourcing, so you can hear about hackathons to solve a problem in a day, and they're also entrepreneurship facile. Okay, so the important thing is that we try to incorporate these things into our classes. Um, in particular, we do this in Engineering 104. Okay, here some team projects, we try to show them, okay, how to prototype something, how to design something, how to come up with a problem, how to work in a team, okay, which is often the, one of the most difficult things for some of these students. And so this is one project for an MP3 player that some students built um, last semester, uh, last year. This is a speaker, okay, it's a Pringles can, but it's basically got the same wavelength as the, the audio that they want to come out, okay, and they built this from scratch um, together. Okay, also we have other, uh, other projects that are things like Arduino microphones that give light shows and so forth. And so this shows you that engineering is evolving and so we are trying to adapt to that as well in, in our department. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, I had the opportunity uh, this past year to be a TEAL Fellow, the Technology Enhanced Active Learning Fellow, and I would encourage anybody who's at this conference who is interested in technology to join, to apply to that group. It's a really wonderful uh, um, group. Brian was wonderful, and the whole interaction is really great. So today I'm going to talk really, really quickly about um, not one particular project. I use technology in all of my classes. I teach history classes, undergraduates, and graduate. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a broad overview on several different technologies I use in my classes. Um, what I've noticed, um, so something that I have in common with the other um, presenters is that the changing landscape of technology, right? Um, a history class used to look like this. So you have students that are static and they're yawning and they're, they're bored and they can't move and there's this top-down hierarch hierarchy where the professor is pouring knowledge into these empty minds. In my classes, what, I've, what you can use technology for is it's a much more fluid exchange. So you can notice people aren't even sitting. One person's sitting on a desk. I hope that's OK. That's the beautiful uh, Teal classroom. But there's an exchange. I am not pouring information into them. We are all exchanging information. 
Um, so when I first started using technology in my classes, I'm going to go through some of this a little bit quickly, um, what a key factor was using it in a way that was meaningful to get them to think about what they were doing with that technology, to get them to reflect on a subject, not just learn a technology, in the subject in my case is history, and to have them work together to solve a problem, then give them time to work alone. And the last thing I had on there was, and it takes a lot of preparation. So what I'm going to talk about today very quickly are the, um, a few different um, technologies that I use to change my classroom into, from a classroom into a, a sort of a collaborative discovery space. Um, online exhibits and timelines, I do those both in my undergraduate and grad classes. Blogs I do in both um, undergrad and grad. And using mobile apps, learning, using your phone to learn from. Um, so. Very quickly, uh, and again, this is a huge um, overview, um, what I like about exhibits and timelines are the students interact with each other, not just with me. So instead of turning in a paper to me, they're interacting with one another, they're interacting with data, they're interacting with the technology, and they're interacting, I make all of my projects have a public facing component. So they're actually teaching, they're forced to get into the role of teaching, because I know I learned the most about history, not when I was in my classes getting earning my PhD, but when I was actually forced to stand up and teach others about it. So, and I think it's very important when you're integrating technology to start small, what I've learned. Um, we think that millennials are really great with tech. They're really not so great with tech, right? But if you start with something that they know, like a Google spreadsheet, it works really well. So this particular timeline is done by Night Labs. It's open source. It's free. It's so easy. Um, the students have to go in and they have to um, build a Google spreadsheet. Uh, build, uh, use a Google spreadsheet to build. This is the back end here, and the front facing end is here. And you can I don't know if you can see the bottom, but it, it's very interactive. You click, the image expands. You get more information. And on the back end, what I like about this is they're not just doing a glossy, meaningless project. They have to use citations. They have to get credit. They learn about um, Copyright, so they really have to work. So they're using the technology, and they get really proud of these um, projects that they're doing because they can share them. I don't do ex online exhibits yet with undergrads. I only do them with graduate students because they're much more complicated. Um, so I send my graduate students out in this um, digital archives and history class into local archives. Um, they're tasked with learning about um, uh, desegregation of Boston public schools. Um, so they have to, and believe it or not, there's not that much information. Uh, we ha the same narratives are told about this event over and over. But those narratives aren't necessarily the most accurate er narratives. There are voices that are left out. So uh, bilingual perspectives are left out. So the students go in, they find something that really resonates with them. They have to learn how to digitize. They have to learn to create metadata. Then they have to learn to interpret this data. And instead of turning in, again, a research paper, a 25-page research paper, they do an online exhibit. This is all interactive, so each one of these items can be clicked on. Um, and they get very proud. They take a lot of ownership in this. So they learn, they're developing these technology skills, but they're also educating others. What I think is particularly valuable um, in, in terms of a learning outcome is they develop the transferable skills and knowledge. Um, I make them map uh, where every item is from. and. Uh, I have a tendency to want to really nurture my students and work with them. So one of the students, and, and this is the first time I taught this class two years ago, sent me this email, a, a, t a chat in Evernote. She was so frustrated. And I just sort of let her go because I knew we were going to meet the next day. And it, it almost killed me to do that. But she figured it out on herself, by herself. And she was so proud when she came to class. And then she taught her uh, fellow students how to do it. So to me, that was a huge learning experience. Um, the uh, other things that I do very quickly, I have, I have blogs in all my classes. I have my students do reflections about, because I want to know if this is working. And so I make them, again, instead of sharing uh, reflections with, just with me, they have to write blog posts 10 per week, not one, 10 per semester, not one per week. And then they all have to um, respond to each other's. And this has been a really big hit. They like that the engagement that they have is really uh, powerful. And they learn. I, I learn more about the way they think by w watching how they interact with one another. Um, and at the end of the semester, they have to do one large reflection that we put into our overall archives and public history blog. Um, the one thing that I uh, would caution anybody to do if you want to encourage, um, how many of you like students use phones in your classroom? 
So uh, just a handful. So I, I do as well because 83% of college students regularly regularly use their smartphones, at least, and that was last year's statistic. Um, so building on technologies they already use and they're comfortable with, I decided I was going to let them, um, we use an, an app called Evernote to communicate. Um, it was terrifying when I first did this. Um, as you can see in the cartoon on the left, I don't know, you know, the it's a distraction you know it's you don't know what they're talking about the picture on the right is when the first time i introduced this i didn't know what they were doing some people look bored some people look annoyed uh, it was very unconventional very unconventional chaotic and discomforting for me but it worked really well and the reason it worked well is students can then send me at any time their notes um, um, they can see my modules on their phone and click and read on their phone and they love that because if they're stuck on the T, they can read it. And the thing that I love is it diminishes their chance to use an excuse that they didn't know where something was or they couldn't do an assignment. It's right in their phone. Um, so there are great results and um, thank you very much. Uh, the, the only thing I would say, it's, it's sort of an iterative cycle and I think uh, building on what everyone else has said, you have to integrate technology in a meaningful way, interact with it, and then it inspires them and they continue to inspire. So thank you so much. This is the way the School of the Environment is kind of organized um, with our academic programs. We have environmental science, environmental studies, sustainability, and community development at the undergrad, environmental science, marine science, and urban planning at the graduate. So all of them have different disciplines. We have faculty from uh, law to oceanography, from um, ecology to planning, from chemistry to engineering. And so we work with our students, and these are all animated for me, so I should stop them. These are all of our students working in the field, and our students have to put in about 3,000 pro bono hours of service during the year. That is because our students actually have to do work on behalf of the communities. This is uh, some pictures of our students working on the top to top ship program. Everything that they do from working with communities and meeting with them one on one to talk about issues that they're facing. Um, working with Living on Earth radio program to actually tell their stories on the Living on Earth radio show, which is internationally broadcast from UMass Boston School for the Environment. Working with um, young people to actually get them engaged in working in the environment and teaching those students what they've learned in the classroom. Oops, I missed the shark picture. You don't want to miss the shark. Oh, darn it. All right, I'll go back to the shark. All right, so our students are actually engaged in a number of things. I'm going to slow this thing down if I can. Um, our students have to do from their first year working um, internationally in the Azores with local communities and also here in Boston all the way to their senior year where they do capstones and we had Kim engage in our capstone this year. The students have to organize Boston-wide activities such as our Science Cafe which is held in coordination with MIT. A lot of you have heard about the sea level issues that we have here in Boston. Our students did all of the data collection and the modeling for that report. Um, they work, they're currently working on the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative for Governor Baker, working with the city of Gloucester to re-examine the waterfront there and the designated port, actually actively engaging with Fishers, that's one of our undergrads who graduated a couple years ago, um, planning for the future of Boston. Right now we have imagined Boston 2030 and we're working, our students are working with them. Our partners at the New England Aquarium, New England Aquarium is part of the School for the Environment our emerald necklace con, um, contacts. We have partnerships with National Park Service, every community and every agency that you can think of. Our faculty are deeply engaged in the field as well with our students. Um, this is a recent trip we took to Western Mass. Um, as you can see, lots of happy, smiling students. But the key thing for us is making sure that from the time they enroll as first year students to the time that they leave, that they actually put everything that they're learning in the classroom to work in the field solving real problems. Those problems, again, can range from um, working with communities in Sicily to take a, a landfill, this is a group of them, take a landfill and actually turn it into a community garden. Working in um, Jamaica Plain with local Native American communities. Working on our campus, actually figuring out how a risk, how, what risk we have for sea level rise um, and sharing that information. And actually doing international conferences on sustainability, um, this was one in Denmark. This is the Our Oceans event with Senator John Kerry and our students participated in that as well. Um, obviously going to different places in the United States and this is Milwaukee where they're presenting their research. We also take uh, advantage of the fact that we have a classroom outside on our harbor. And we also have classrooms in Svalbard, Norway. 
So our students are traveling, this is them in Brazil. And so when we talk about something happening in the environment, we want to make sure that our students actually see those processes and those problems up front and in person. We assess this, and the assessing this is very difficult, right? Because the way in which we assess in the classroom typically is we're going to give them an exam to make sure that they learned all this stuff. That's great, right? But it doesn't actually tell us that our students know how to work in teams, that they know how to design and implement solutions, that they can work across disciplinary boundaries from law to engineering. One of the key things for us is making sure that we are only doing this because they are problem solvers. And we know they are problem solvers because they can get a job. And we have a 100% placement record of our students when they leave here. Three months out, 100% of them are employed in their field. This is an ongoing statistic for us. So what that means is that we know that our students are getting the skills that they need to gain employment to solve the real problems that we have. And this is just 2016, three months out where they are. And you'll see a couple of them are self-employed. And that's because we have a couple of students who are now, this is becoming an emerging trend in our program, starting their own nonprofits and their own NGOs working in Boston. And so they're also learning some management skills along the way. So that's us. Before I begin, I must say uh, a quick uh, recognition to iClicker, a company from Macmillan, for sponsoring lunch. Wow. So, th so this is not uh, coming out of uh, our, our university budget. So, so thank you to, 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 to iClicker up there. So, uh, I also want, uh, want to uh, take a minute just to thank the uh, four speed uh, talks this morning. I think they were really excellent uh, from uh, uh, Ted, uh, from Kim, uh, Marilyn Morgan, and from Dean Hannigan. Uh, it's, it's always surprising how much you learn in just those five minutes of those really quick presentations. So, so that's really exciting. It's something new that we started last year. We're sort of really excited to do it again this year. So, um, Before I introduce the next speaker, um, we, we, I, I do want to take a minute to also mention that we expanded uh, our committee. We added uh, three new members to it. Uh, Professor Philippe uh, Chutkov, um, Caitlin Zara, and Oliver Chen, along with Ayana McCoy. So, so we really sort of are trying to diversify and, try to, and trying to extend our reach. Um, and as a result of that, we've, we've been able to get uh, both Tej and Kim to come and can, can pre uh, present at our speed talk. So, so that's really um, exciting. If you'd like to sort of volunteer for the committee, we are always Looking for new blood. <laughs> um, something new also that we've done this year is, uh, I think this is the first time we've included our program onto an app. I must thank Linda Sadleski for putting it together. Um, our, our, goal is to, our goal is to go paperless, and I promise next year we will not have a program book, booklet to give you. You'll have to download it onto your iPhone or your Android device, because I know all of you have one, maybe two. Uh, so um, that's, that's something new for this year. Um, so it is my honor and my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Chancellor J. Keith Martley. And he really needs no introduction, right? <laughs> for we all know the wonderful... <laughs> <man of you>. <laughs> <laughs> for we all know the wonderful accomplishments we see it around us each and every day. And I've seen it, for, especially for the past uh, nine to 10 years, you've seen the campus really sort of transform, both from a student perspective, uh, as well as from a faculty and staff perspective. So, so really indebted to, to, to the chancellor for that. I would like to personally thank him for his support in giving me the opportunity to grow professionally. So thank you, chancellor. We were all very excited when we learned that he would be joining us today. Uh, the committee was really excited, and you know, we, we scrambled last minute, and, and we sort of, you know, <laughs> we, we regrouped, and, uh, and, and we are very fortunate to have you here. Thank you. You've been a great supporter of this event for the past, past many years, and I hope you will continue to attend, Chancellor. I'll give you Chancellor J. Keith Mark. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? How are you? It's good to see you. Thank you for this. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you and be energized by you one more time. You know, 
Sometimes you just need to be with folk you know care just as much as you do about not only this university, but just about life in general and our opportunity to serve in the spaces that we serve in. Aperva, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this event, for developing this committee. I love your growth. I've grown. Every moment I'm on this campus, I grow because of you. Every opportunity that I have to um, serve, I am honored because I'm serving with you. I also want to say to each and every one of you, Thank you for coming today, and I hope that you found some way to retool and sort of engage and learn in ways that you didn't even imagine were possible prior to coming. I hope that when you woke up, you didn't even want to come this morning. <laughs> but you got here, and you realized that this is where you should have been, because that's what it's all about. We all have those days, but we also have those days where we understand the gift that we are to each other. Starting with the gift of those who put this event together today. Thank you for <clears throat> whatever role you had. If you were ordering lunch, fixing lunch, sending out paper clips, whatever you did to make this work, thank you uh, in this room. If you were presenting, give them a round of applause. A pervert didn't tell you that um, I think once in one of these kind of settings around technology, they had heard that, you know, I've been teaching here for the last 14 years. I've been at this university for 14 years. For one of those nine months, I, I served as vice chancellor for student affairs. And I had promised one of our colleagues, who's now an ancestor, who's passed on, that I would teach. And I had thought that when she passed, I was going to get out of that promise. But I was doing her memorial service, and her family walked up to me, and they said, so when are you going to start teaching your class? And I'm so glad that I began to do that. 14 years ago, I do it in June. I do it as a co-instructor. But it's kept me in the classroom. But what I brought that up for was that one year, we were boasting about the kind of technology we were using in the class. And someone heard that, and they made me one of the featured luncheon speakers or something at a technology event like this to teach people. The, the fortunate thing was I was wise enough to bring the students who were the ones who had taught me anything I needed to know and had set up everything I needed to do in that class with me as the people to do the presentation. So I stood up here as if it was me. But then I brought the real people forward who do it all. So today, again, I stand up here as if it was me. And I've told you in this journey that each and every one of you are chancellors of your space. That wherever you are in this institution, you are the chancellor of that space. So I stand in front of you as if it's me, but I know it's you. And so everything we've done together over these last few years, if it is successful, and it will be. If it is the excellence that we know it's going to be, it's because of the excellence of Y-O-U. And, you know, M.E. will take a lot of credit for that every now and then, particularly as he moves forward in life over the, in the future. And I look back at these days with you. That's the comfort I have going forward. I also have comfort in the fact that colleagues like this understand that it's important to hit a trifecta like the one that you had today when you talk about teaching, learning, and technology and the intersection of those entities. And what an opportunity that becomes to share. Then when I look at who and how and what you shared this morning, then you're going to pause for a moment and you're going to grace us with awards of people who have, and or entities that have done fantastic pieces, and then go back to work, learning again. What an amazing opportunity for us today. And so, you know, I'm honored to be here. The elements of this great academic institution all around this room, with all of you representing those elements, you've done it. 
done it, you'll continue to do it, and I love the fact that I've been able to be here with you while we're doing it. I love this conference theme. Reaching 21st century students, teaching values, and also teaching practices. It's amazing how far we've come in that regard as an institution. You know, before I came here, I had no idea of the excellence that already existed here. But as we start this journey together, and as that word has gotten out, and it's out, and it's out, and it's out, I understand that the excellence exists and continues to build, and it's part of your DNA, and it's part of the DNA of this institution. So do others, and I'm so proud of that, because no matter where I go, no matter how far I go, I hear about you. In some discipline, someone's running up to me every day telling me something new about this institution, and it's all about you. So I'm proud of that some of the best innovations and the most thought-provoking research are coming from this campus, but I'm also proud that the values that you bring to work every, that work ethic that you bring, that centers our work in our students, and prepares them for whatever it is that's going to come next. Things that we don't even begin to think that we know are going to be next for them. And that's what I'm so proud of. So I know that you have some terrific sessions this afternoon. I'm not going to bore you with things you already know. But I do know that I'm going to get out the way in a moment. But I had to show up because when I started seeing some of the intersection, not only where we were talking about technology and those kinds of things, and I'm also someone who plays the, well, I used to be a pretty good violinist. I guess I'll have an opportunity to sort of figure out if I can at least get the G on good again <laughs> and without killing my children when they listen to me in my music room at home. But the reality is when I started seeing how we were talking about having students going to classrooms of children that were having some challenges and using music and other innovations to help those students develop, but also in turn teaching our students the value of access and opportunity and to be grateful for not only what they have but their ability to serve and help others get what they know and get where they know they need to go to make a difference as they go forward in their lives. What an amazing thing. So this was really a long way of saying thank you. Thank you for um, this opportunity to serve you as your chancellor. But more importantly, thank you because I have never felt unwelcomed in this community. And I know going forward, I will never, ever have to worry about feeling that way. And no matter whether I come back here to teach, visit, work, play, relax, chill on the ocean, chill in one of the new facilities, help advocate for another one, I know that this is home. And thank you for never making any day of my life here feel any different. So proud of you. I'm honored to be among you. Thank you for continuing to learn. And thank you, more importantly, for continuing to serve. Thank you all so much. And so, and so now, now, Emily, come on forward, because I know this is supposed to be the drum roll, and we're getting ready to give out some awards. And what's, what is interesting is one of the first people that I met when I came to this campus is standing to my right, your left. And she served in so many capacities here, but what was so important was she was willing to help. Here was this kid coming over here from Northeastern thinking he knew everything, right? And didn't really need to know. And she knew me from that experience there because we had, I had the honor of having worked with one of her children. When I got here, helped me navigate through that system. And so 
I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to have you here today to stand here while you give out the awards and take some pictures. Thank you, Keith. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yes, Harry, Harry. Give Harry a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Brett. Well, uh, let's just start in with the awards. I'm Emily McDermott. I'm Associate Provost and Dean of the Faculty and happy to be here with you all today to recognize these very exciting ventures. Um, would Dr. Michaela Perina come forward and Dr. Chris Zern, her, the Chair of the Philosophy Department? Mm. Michaela Perina is an associate professor of philosophy and was nominated for innovation in face-to-face -face teaching for Philosophy 450 rights. In this course, Professor Perina guides students through an examination of contemporary rights, te sorry, contemporary rights discourse by introducing them to competing philosophical interpretations and teaching them to effectively communicate these complicated philosophical theories. The, the remarkable outcome of Professor Perina's pedagogy was obvious during the philosophy department's spring symposium on the work of renowned social and political philosopher Charles Mills. Professor Perina tasked her students with leading the welcome discussion that opened the symposium. The students' astute questions to Professor Mills demonstrated a facility with the central debates and critical analyses of major work in the field. Their impressive performance was a direct result of professors, Pro Professor Perina's innovation in the classroom, guiding our students through weeks of critiques of articles on rights and rights discourse that culminated in the class developing, discussing, and revising discussion questions in preparation for Professor Mills's visit. By organizing the symposium discussion around her students' questions, Professor Perina encouraged the students to take ownership of the intellectual life of the university and the dis discipline of philosophy. We congratulate Professor Perina for her outstanding achievement and award her the 2017 Senior Faculty Award for Face-to-Face -face Teaching. Okay, everybody on this side. The pictures are the important thing. <laughs> you take it, it's your award now. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Would Dr. Philip Chuchkoff come forward from the engineering department? Since joining UMass Boston in the fall of 2013, Dr. Philip Truchkoff has successfully proposed five new courses for the computer engineering curriculum, designed and developed new materials for six courses, obtained industry support and donations for hardware and software needed for laboratory and curriculum modernization, and received overwhelmingly positive teaching evaluations for every class that he has taught. His teaching methods promote hands-on learning, which he has achieved by vertically integrating a hardware platform as the core technology around which materials and labs are taught in core courses in the computer engineering curriculum. The development boards enable a new teaching modality, take-home labs. This approach has impacted our students' learning tremendously, enabling them to gain practical skills from classes that do not have a traditional lab component. His research lab consistently attracts top quality engineering students, allowing them to gain valuable academic experience far beyond the traditional classroom. Under his guidance in the senior design project, our inaugural class of electrical engineering seniors graduated in summer 2016. 
We congratulate Professor Chuchkov for his outstanding achievement and award him the 2017 Junior Faculty Award for Face-to-Face -face Teaching. Dr. Paul Watanabe from Political Science is being awarded the Senior Faculty Award for Community Engaged Teaching. He's unfortunately not able to be here today, but I'm still going to read out the citation for him. Professor Paul Watanabe offers an innovative model of transnational community engagement and enrichment. This year, for the second time in three years, Professor Watanabe won a grant from the U.S.-Japan Council to bring a group of 23 UMass Boston students to Japan for a week-long community-engaged learning experience. These students, the, the to, hmm, Tonada, Tomodachi Inoue scholars, were selected from a diverse array of majors. Before leaving for Japan, they researched various aspects of Japanese culture and history, and then met in Boston with their student counterparts from Showa Women's University in Tokyo. After traveling to Japan, led by Professor Watanabe, they received briefings from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Tokyo government before traveling to Hiroshima to meet with an atomic bomb survivor. This was not only a unique bridge-building exercise for the students, but also, as many of them put it, a life-changing experience. Professor Watanabe made this possible and demonstrates how community-driven pedagogy can reach well beyond the U.S. border. We congratulate Professor Watanabe and award him the 2017 Senior Faculty Award for Community-Engaged Teaching. Accepting the award for Paul Watanabe, Chancellor <laughs> J. Keith Motley. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would Dr. Amy Cook come up from the Counseling and School Psychology Department? Professor Amy Cook innovatively infuses graduate counseling courses with community-engaged curriculum. In cultural diversity and counseling, she challenges students to move beyond cultural awareness to taking action through partnering with a community different from their own. They reflect on activities as they relate to students' identities. For example, how privilege and oppression connect with divergent and convergent worldviews. In one online course, a student praised her for the way she, quote, used, wide, used wit video clips from visitors on the main campus to give us an equal experience to those students that are, are fortunate enough to be on campus. The service learning project gave me the chance to go out in the community and work with youth. In her school counseling practicum, students engage in counseling practices with urban youth. One student noted, this was definitely a course that stretched my thinking. I thought that I had a lot of acceptance towards groups of different beliefs and cultures, but you got us thinking about diversity in new ways that I would not have considered before. We congratulate Professor Cook and award her the 2017 Junior Faculty Award for Community Engaged Teaching. We're going to want you Picture. right in the middle. Oh, right, right here. here. Okay. And congratulations. Harry's the boss. That's, uh...
Dr. Janet Callinger from the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education and Human Development is receiving the online senior faculty award, but she's not able to be here. I'll read the citation anyway. Professor Janet Kellinger has designed several online courses as semester-long games. These range from mysteries, where students are private investigators hired to find out who vandalized the principal's Facebook page by going undercover as a new teacher, to save the world scenarios in which students have been transported into the future to help expert elders figure out how to teach future generations before the elders die. Mm. Dr. Kellinger not only uses game-based teaching to design her online courses, she has presented on it at the UCTLT conference multiple times, as well as conducted workshops and presentations at national conferences. In addition, she has numerous book chapters and articles on the topic, and Springer just published her book, a Guide to Designing Curricular Games. We congratulate Professor Kellinger and honor her achievement with the 2017 Senior Faculty Award for Online Teaching. <laughs> and finally, would Dr. Karen Ross uh, of the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance come forward as well as Dean David Cash from the McCormick Graduate School. Karen is um, receiving the Junior Faculty Award for Online Teaching. This semester, after two years of planning and design, Professor Karen Ross taught an innovative hybrid online in-person class on facilitation and dialogue. This skill building course included a practical experiential component, facilitating actual dialogues among youth from around the world on contentious issues. Um, using the online platform of the internationally recognized NGO SOLIA, with whom Dr. Ross has developed a long-term partnership. Since questions of geographic distance, cost, and security are often barriers preventing conflict parties from engaging meaningfully with each other, this innovative approach uses cutting-edge technological approaches to allow students to develop conflict resolution skills working in the field even while remaining in Boston. Students have benefited significantly from this type of learning. One student writes, I have found that spending two focused hours with people online in a private small space has a profound effect on my thinking about the value of virtual relationships and their power to impact others in a variety of ways. Professor Ross has prioritized the development of this program for what may become an approach more broadly adopted by the department and by the field of conflict resolution. We congratulate Professor Ross and honor her achievement with the 2017 Junior Faculty Award for Online Teaching. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Motley and Emily, and congratulations again to all the award winners. Uh, we're always looking for new talent, as I'd mentioned earlier. So if you'd like to join our committee or be one of our speed talkers, uh, we're always uh, welcome and you know, do, do, do let us know. Um, there is a session at 1.30, I believe, but before you head out there, there's some very cool technology at the back of the room. There's some 3D printers, there's, uh, you can learn about classroom capture, voice thread. Uh, there's a new, uh, I think, a library automation system that's coming out. You can talk to folks at CAPS online. Um, the synchronous communication tools if you want to use Zoom for your classes. So uh, if you have uh, a few minutes, do stop by. I believe there are some cookies up there as well. So um, we clearly want to finish all that food. So, so thank you again for coming. Um, and we hope to see you next year. <laughs>